everybody we are going to get started with uh, today's live video feed uh, you're looking right now at dr. Bryce Simmons who is going to uh, introduce himself and some of the people on the research project you can take it away Bryce okay thanks Todd uh, I take it you can hear me in there I can hear you. okay um, I don't normally talk like this the reason I'm talking like this is because I've got a microphone that's inside this mask. And so that's what you're going to be hearing me on as I do my dive. But because the, high, the microphone is inside this mask, I have to talk under the mask even when I'm on the deck. We are on the boat RV Seakeeper. This is the Cayman Islands Department of Environment's research vessel. This boat is has been brought over from Grand Cayman to here on Little Cayman Island. And we're here for the uh, about two weeks. We're doing research on Nassau grouper populations that happen to be here on the island. Little Cayman it has the distinction of being uh, one of the locations in the Caribbean that still has a very large population of Nassau grouper. And it, it offers us the opportunity to do some really neat studies and monitoring to um, determine the status of the population or how many fish there are, for instance, and how big they are, and how many new fish show up each year. Uh, on the boat with me, we have a bunch of different researchers. I'll introduce you here to Croy McCoy. Croy is the research lead from the Cayman Islands Department of Environment on this project, and Croy's actually going to be doing the dive with me. He's going to be my dive buddy while we're diving here on Bloody Bay. Hi, Turks and Caicos. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. Uh, I was just introducing the team here before we go on the dive. We're going to get in the water shortly. Uh, we talked about Croy. We've got Dr. Steve Giddings from the National Marine Sanctuary Program in, in the U.S. We've got Scott Hapella, who's a professor at Oregon State University. We've got uh, Cody Panton, who's a um, research officer with the Cayman Islands Department of Environment, uh, and several different DOE staff and crew that are uh, always excellent and keep us safe and operational at all times. So we couldn't do this without everybody's uh, help and expert support in that regard. Uh, okay, so... I am going to now stop talking for a little bit. I'm going to put my scuba gear on, and then once I get my mask on, you're going to hear me breathing off of my tank. So while we're scuba diving, maybe some of you are scuba divers, but I bet most of you aren't yet. You probably will be someday. When you do become scuba divers, what you're going to need to rely on is bringing air with you underwater. And the way that we do that is we use these tanks. These tanks have compressed air. They're just basically they squeeze a bunch of air into that small tank, and then this thing right here is called a regulator. That modulates the amount of pressure or air that comes from my tank into my mask, and that's how I can breathe underwater. Troy's going to have a regulator on as well. We're going to spend about half an hour under the, under the ocean here. Bloody Bay Wall is a, one of the most famous dive sites in all of the Caribbean. It's a beautiful dive site. It's got a very healthy coral reef. Hopefully, we'll get to see lots of predators here, including the Nassau grouper. And we're on a wall, so we get to see some pretty spectacular fish and corals and, and marine life. Uh, with that, I'll start getting geared up, and Cole will start getting geared up, and we'll um, we'll hit the water. Stand by, folks. All right, everyone. Uh, Bryce is now going to suit up with his Aga face mask, but it allows him to speak to you while diving underwater. Um, right now, he's putting on his BCD, which uh, is connected to his octopus, gives him uh, oxygen, connected to his tank. We have a couple of other researchers that are going to be going down with him. Uh, you're going to notice there's a couple of lines that are tethered to Bryce. Those are the lines that allow him that allow him to speak to you. The dive site that we're on today uh, is called Mixing Bowl, which is on Little Cayman's famous Bloody Bay Wall. We're going to hope to go down and see some of the Nassau grouper that have just finished spawning back on their home reef. Uh, and I'm, I'm betting you're going to see them behaving a bit different today uh, than we've seen them uh, behave out on the aggregation. Okay, folks. Uh can you hear me okay? Perfect. Uh, okay, folks. Uh, just about ready here. In a little bit, I'm going to seal up my mask. When I do, you're going to start hearing 
be a breed off of my tank. It's going to sound like a, a little bit like a whoosh of air every once in a while. That's me taking a breath. Uh, well, we're getting ready to jump in. I bet you the population of NASA group is here on Little Cayman. It's one of the largest in the world. So, but the Caymans uh, consist of three main islands. Grand Cayman, which is the big one, and then the two sister islands of Little Cayman and Cayman Brack. We're actually studying NASA group of populations on all three islands. And this week, we spent quite a bit of time over on Cayman Brack as well, looking at the population of NASA group over there. And I'll tell you, there's a, quite a few pretty big old fish over on Cayman Brack as well. So it's exciting to see healthy populations on a couple of different islands. Uh, for a species that is actually endangered throughout its range, and in the United States has just been listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act. Stand up here. Let's see, Roy, are you all ready to go? Bryce, it looks like we also have uh, Spot Bay on Cayman Brack watching uh, from YouTube. Oh, excellent. Hi, Spot Bay. We were just talking about your national group of population. We were checking it out just this week doing some research over there. Uh, I know we talked a little bit about this before, those of us who were on the, the live chat, we took our stereo video system over to Little Cayman, and then we used those two cameras in order to be able to tell the lengths of fish that we video. Now that's a powerful research tool that allows us to say something about the population and how it changes through time. Okay, I think we're ready to jump in, so I'm going to walk to the back of the boat. We'll jump in the water, and we're going to click OK sign, that means OK in scuba, and then we're going to head down and see the wall. Let's go, guys. You can hear me now. I'm breathing off my tank. Can you hear that? We can hear you perfect. Excellent. Okay. There we go. Get into the water. Oh, really? Hi, Spot Bay. We now have you live with us hanging out, which is awesome. Welcome. Okay, guys. We're going to slowly descend. Hey, now we're underwater. So we're cooking with gas. I'm going to wave the bubbles off that. There you go. All right. Well, anyway, we're directly under the boat now. We're about 15 feet of water to the bottom. And, and you're seeing a lot of fish already. See those ones with the yellow stripe? Those are the yellow tail snapper, the plate divorce. They eat little bits of food out of the water. I'm going to test my uh, communication system with my camera, uh, Scott. Hey, Scott, can you hear me? All right. Scott can hear me. Technology is amazing, my friends. And we have our second classroom from the Brack that has now joined us live. Excellent. Welcome. Thanks for joining. All right, we're going to swim up toward the bow of the boat. Try to get our thing our way over to the wall. And as we're swimming up towards the, the bow of the boat, you're going to notice that underneath the water, it's not just a bunch of rocks. In fact, all of this area is the remains of old dead coral. And on it grows all kinds of different species. There's an abundance of life down here. We're seeing sea fans, lots of different kinds of soft coral, and sponges as well. There we I'm also seeing lots of parrotfish. Scott, can you go ahead and show some of the parrotfish that are right by you there? Now, I wonder if I could ask a question of the students, Todd. I, wonder, I bet there's several students out there who knows why parrotfish are really important. Can you repeat that question, Bryce? Yeah. I'm just saying that I bet some of the students know why parrotfish are important for reefs. 
uh, does anyone in any of the classrooms watching right now uh, on Grand, on uh, the BRAC, or in Turk Caicos, do you have any idea how important or why parrot fish are important on the reef? Did Raleigh well, we get the answer to that? We're now coming up on the edge of the wall here. This is a mini wall. So it's, some of the walls here are a little cave it drops vertically thousands of feet. This one is only a small one, but it's okay because it's a good one for us to do a, a nice safe dive on and show you what it all looks like. All right. Well, I'm starting to see some live coral here, too. Stop there, you give them an up close of some of the live coral that I'm starting to see here. Now, coral is interesting. Because it kind of looks like a rock, right? But in fact, it's a colony of little animals. Each of them the same as the other. They, they're many little animals that are cones of each other. And they secrete calcium. It's a, like a kind of rock. And they, in doing so, they build their own home. And they, they can feed in two different ways. They can feed uh, using their tentacles to catch things that float by in the water. But they also have something in them called zooxanthellae. That's a fun word. Zooxanthellae is actually an algae. And that algae goes inside the coral that each of the little animals and it photosynthesizes. It uses light from the sun in order to make energy, and it gives some of that energy to the coral, to the animal. And that's how the animal is able to get enough energy to grow and reproduce. Hey Bryce, why is um, healthy coral so important for a healthy reef? Well, healthy coral, the coral is really the, the template, the, the structure uh, that, that, that coral reefs are made of. So. The, those animals, as they grow, they secrete more calcium, and they create that structure. They create their own home. And all of this that you see are the, is the structure that's recreated by corals over hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of years. If you don't have healthy, growing corals, you don't have the animals that are building this reef. And over time, that reef can break down. The structure goes away. That structure is really important because it's the thing that other animals like fish and invertebrates, crabs, lobster, they need in order for their habitat, in order for them to survive and do well. Bryce, I'm seeing some coral out there that's hard, but then it looks like there's other things that are that are soft. Can you talk about the difference between those? Sure, yeah. So in addition to coral, we have uh, lots of different kinds of uh, animals that don't make hard structure. Uh, like, hey Scott, can you uh, go ahead and show those sort of sponges? Different kinds of sponges. Yeah, here you go. This, uh, this is more of a sort of a low profile or encrusting sponge. And here we have a tube sponge. And obviously, uh, you know, the reason why they call it a tube sponge is because it looks like a tube. Sponges are actually animals as well, but uh, they're filter feeders, so they actually bring water through them, and they filter out all the particles of the water, and that's how they they they, uh, they survive. And some of them are small, like those, and others are big. So let me have Scott show you. Hey Scott, could you show them the barrel sponge that's right by you there? Scott, to your uh, to your right. There's a big barrel spud. Oh, I'm not sure he can hear me right now. There you go. There's the barrel spud. Ah, and you can see, here's Cry. Hey, Cry. How big do those barrel sponges get? They look big. They are very big. Yeah. Some of them can get so big that you can actually sit inside them. Of course, we don't do that because they're pretty easy to damage. Uh, but these sponges, they're built this way uh, in order to maximally filter water. 
but you can see just kind of the structure of them. They're really good habitat for things that uh, need to, you know, hide. So there's often lots of little gobies on them. That, but they can be tiny, those, those fish that live on the sponges. So we're going to go a little further down here. And, uh... I'm going to always keep my eyes out, especially in a raw situation like this, for large predators that might come by. Uh, Bryce, can you tell us what role do those predators play on a healthy reef? Yeah. So, I, I don't keep my eye out for large predators because I'm scared of them. In fact, I've seen a lot of sharks over uh, my lifetime. Never had any problems with them at all. And this is... To show you, this is my computer. Uh, this tells me everything I need to know about my dive. It tells me how much pressure I have left in my tank and how deep I am. Right now I'm at 42 feet. Okay. Um, anyway, so those sharks, they're, I don't want to talk to them because they're really cool. And as, Scott, uh, as Tom said, they play a very important role in the ecosystem. Colors, it turns out, are very important. Uh, for like maintaining balance to the ecosystem. And here's a shark right now. How about that? On cue. You guys see that? We see that. That's cool. All right, so that's a nurse shark. Nurse sharks are one of the most common sharks that we see here on Bloody Bay. And, uh, and we see several different kinds of sharks here. Like the day before, uh, before we started broadcasting, we also saw a hammerhead. So lots of different kinds of large predators. Anyway, these predators are important for maintaining the structure and ecosystem of a Caribbean coral reef. And it's not just sharks. It's big predators like Nassau Grupa that are also very important to the system. And so when you have those big predators, uh, oftentimes you'll find them associated with, with healthy reefs. Right, so we have a question They're asking, how deep are you now on the reef? I am 46 feet in depth. What's that in meters? It's about, uh, about 12 meters or so. Yeah. Um, All right, do you think that we could see some fish? Do you have, uh, are there any of the smaller fish floating around there that you might be able to show us? Do you want to see some fish? Yeah, let's go over here on, well, look at some, uh, here's a pretty fish. We talked about big predators, right? Like sharks, a grouper. Right. I'm going to show you a little predator. How about that? Now, if you were a worm, or maybe a really small crab, these guys would be terrifying to you. Because they are sea bass, they're a kind of sea bass. But they're really small, they're fairy basslets. I'm going to show them a fairy basslet. See these guys? They're beautiful. They're little purple and yellow. There's lots of them along the wall. Now those guys, they are predators. And they eat lots of different things. The only thing is they never get bigger than about that. So it takes all kinds of predators, not just the big ones that we think about, like sharks, to play a role in the ecosystem. And when we get deeper here, we're going to see some uh, some species that we tend to find on walls, like blue chromis. Shot, let's show them a blue chromis over here. And these chromis species, they're plankton pickers. So they live on places like walls. And the walls are good for them because the water comes out of the ocean. And it arrives at the wall and it brings in lots of tasty things that are floating in the water called plankton. And, uh, and they eat that plankton. Hey, Bryce, I'm noticing some green stuff growing out there on the reef. What is that? An, is that a good sign or a bad sign for a healthy reef? Yeah. That's a great question, Todd. Uh, turns out that uh, coral aren't the only... Um, things on the reef that like to, to take up space. The green stuff that you're seeing is actually largely an algae. Lots of different kinds of it, actually. And some of that algae can be good, 
Like Palomita? Let me show you this. This is Palomita. Now that is actually uh, algae, but it creates a hard skeleton. So a lot of the times when you feel kind of big sand, it's actually old pieces of Palomita. So that's calcareous algae. It's important for reefs. But other algae, you know, so soft, fleshy algae like this, it's really good at competing for space. And in fact, if you didn't have herbivores, or things like uh, surgeon fish and the parrot fish we saw earlier, if you didn't have those, uh, well, the, the algae would outcompete the coral. So the herbivores, the things that eat the algae, are actually really good uh, for, for rain training. They help the reef with coral. Uh, so my dive buddy coral, you just found an arrow crab. Arrow crabs are... Uh, you guys see that? We're going to put them back on the reef now. Yeah, we're going to let out These guys are also plankton creatures, and they tend to live in uh, small holes and crevices. There you go. All right. See you later, buddy. No, they're, but they're really pretty, too. They're kind of cool. Let's see. What else can we find out here? Ah, I see one of our... Soon the NASA grouper's most favorite treats of all. Let's see if we can find him. It's called a squirrel fish. Squirrel fish are apparently very delicious, according to the NASA grouper. But they'll spend a lot of time hunting them. Uh, uh, he just disappeared on me. He probably thought I was a NASA grouper. That happens sometimes. Right. The common question that I get uh, is um, with regards to seeing predators on the reef. Um, do you want to see a lot of predators, or do you only want to see a few predators? How does that work? Yeah, uh, that, it's kind of hard to say how much predators is enough. Uh, in part because these days on most reefs, especially in the Caribbean, there are anywhere near as many predators as there used to be. And so, while well, I can't say how much is enough, I can certainly say that there aren't as many predators as there probably should be. Certainly not as many predators as a natural reef would support, with very few exceptions. Uh, it would seem that if you had so many predators that they would eat all of the smaller fish, so wouldn't you want less predators? <laughs> yeah, so that's... That's a great question. I'm going to answer that, but I wanted to show you our friend the NASA group. I just found one. Come on down. I'm going to show them the NASA group. It's right down here. He's getting clean. He's at a cleaning station. So if we kind of sneak up on him here. Let's see. I don't think Scott sees him yet. He's hiding on us. All right. You see him now, Scott? Yeah, he's closing in on him. There you go, there's our friend, the Nassau grouper. He's staying really uh, still right now, because he's getting clean. Uh, if you get even closer, Scott, you might be able to see the, the fish, the cleaning station. There he goes. All right, so, the cleaning station. You guys ever been to a car wash, right? The cleaning stations are like car washes. A big... A uh, fish like a Nassau grouper can show up next to a small goby or other different kinds of little fish. And those little fish will interpret the behavior of the Nassau grouper and say, ah, okay, he wants to be clean. And then they'll got to bounce all around and they'll pick off little parasites and pieces of dead skin. And they'll give them a good, nice cleaning. All for free. While the fish that are doing the cleaning, they get a meal out of it. They get to eat the the parasites and things that are growing on the Nassau grouper. And the Nassau grouper, of course, he gets clean, so he enjoys it. Right, would those fish normally be hanging out together? Not typically, no. <laughs> and so it's, it's really interesting, actually, the way that, the way that they, uh, they, they have this arrangement is they can tell that the Nassau grouper is interested in cleaning and not eating because of the way it behaves when it comes up to the cleaning station. 
So they've got this kind of, they've got this whole system worked out. It's really interesting. And you can see, this is actually a pretty friendly mass on green car. That's why it's letting Scott get up close and personal. So if we just, I came in and said, hi, mass on green car. Good job. You give him a little pat. Oh, good. Good job, buddy. That's uh, one of the special things about the Caymans in general, and Body Bay Wall here in particular, is because we do have Nassau Grouper here, we get to have a pretty great diving experience because we can have this kind of an interaction with a big, large predator in the wild. And there you can see he's getting cleaned by goeys. Now maybe see if you can sneak in there and show them the goeys that are cleaning the Nassau Grouper back there. See if you can show them the cleaning that's happening. Great. We have another question from the BRAC. The question is, how many fish can you find on a reef here? Uh, how many fish I can find on a reef? Yes. How many species of fish would you find on a reef here in the Cayman Islands? Oh, great question. If I was diving and I was looking really hard, I might see close to a uh, hundred species of fish. There are as many as 700 species of fish that have been described from the region. A place like Body Bay has a pretty high diversity of fishes, and so it's not that hard to get to 100. In other places in the Caribbean, you might get to 50 or 70. Scott's just showing you there uh, that a spiny lobster that's underneath the, the ledge. Lobster are also predators. They tend to eat other invertebrates. And of course, they're tasty, so we like to eat them as well. Grace, I'm noticing all kinds of stuff floating by you. It almost looks like you're flying through stars. What is all that stuff that you're swimming through? Yeah. So some of it is silt, like sand and sediment. But some of it is plankton, or little animals that live in the water column. Uh, those animals that live in the water column, they may be uh, like plants, like algae. They may photosynthesize, create energy from sunlight. But others are actually animals that eat each other. So you get a whole ecosystem of animals and plants that are all just floating out in the ocean. And when they come crashing into a wall like this, well, they end up crashing into a wall of mouths. The, those planktivores, those fish we talked about before, just like this one right here. The bicolor, it's a couple of bicolor damsel fish. That's a bicolor damsel fish right there. And that guy is particularly good at eating plankton. So you're living your life and being happy as a plankton, then you come out of the deep blue sea, run into this wall, and there you go, there's your, there's where you meet your fate. That's where a little bicolor damsel will eat you. And so all the animals that live on coral reefs don't rely exclusively on uh, the production or the, the food that comes from the coral reef. A lot of the animals rely on food that comes from the ocean in the form of plankton. There's Scott showing you some uh, four-eye butterfly fish there. Uh, all right, we have a, another question from the BRAC, and the question is, how big can a grouper be? Yeah, how big? Okay. Um, depends on the species. A uh, large Nassau grouper can be about 80 centimeters. I guess that's what, about three feet? And can be about 20 kilograms. And that's, uh, you know... 40 to 60 pounds would be a big one. But there are other species of grouper like the Goliath grouper, and those can be, um, you know, 600 pounds. Very, very big. Uh, and, go ahead, Scott. Uh, uh, Todd? Right. So, um, we often hear about uh, Bloody Bay Wall being uh, one of the, the best dive spots uh, on Little Cayman and an example of a healthy reef. What, what is it that you're seeing down there that tells you that this is a, a relatively healthy reef? Yeah, great question. Um, so, this place looks like a healthy reef to me for uh, a couple of different reasons. One is we're seeing the large... Uh, Predators, like the Nassau Grouper we saw, like the shark that we saw, 
They think of diversity of different kinds of animals and plants, algae, like the like the uh, the uh, the animals that eat the plankton, the earlobes, like the surgeon fish and uh, the parrot fish. And we're also seeing uh, a lot of coral cover and a lot of sponges. So taken together, there's a lot of creatures that build a structure here, and there's a lot of creatures that rely on that restructure in order to survive. And that whole community works together and you can see it all happening right here. It's a, it's a fun place to dive because you can see what a wild, healthy reef should look like when you're here. It's a lot of fun. A lot of times we compare a coral reef to a city. In, in what ways do you see uh, that down there as being like a city? Yeah, great question. Uh, Joe, well, like we were talking about before, we have these animals that are structure builders that, that make the bones of the reef. Those are like coral or calcareous algae. And then we got the animals that live in that structure. So think of it as like buildings and high rises and the people that live in them. And then uh, we got all kinds of other animals that are associated with it. Does anyone uh, do any cleanup out there in our city? Sorry. <laughs> Well, we do do a lot of cleanups, like getting rid of the brown algae and other uh, uh, things that, that compete with coral. And those are done by the parrot fishes and surgeon fishes. And of course, uh, we do the cleanup of the water, but that's done by sponges. So there are a lot of parts to a coral reef, and all of them work together in order to create the beautiful ecosystem that we're looking at here today. We have another question from the Brack. It's a good one. Uh, how big can coral be? Uh, huge is the answer. The cool thing about coral is like we were talking about before, it's not just one animal. Right? So this, this coral right here that uh, Scott's going to show you, that's not one animal. That's many, many different animals. Each one of those little polyps here is a single animal. I'm not going to touch it, but I'm just going to add that to you. And, but they're all the same. They're all clones of each other. But, so they just, they, they polyp. They make a new individual every once in a while. And because of that, in theory, this has the potential to grow infinitely. Right, so I read somewhere, and I'm not sure if it's true, that the largest living structure on the planet is a coral reef. Well, it's certainly true that, uh, that the coral reef, all the coral that grows in a coral reef, over time, it builds up the structure. So this whole we're all looking at is, in fact, the skeletons of old dead coral. And so places like here, the Bloody Bay Law, places like the beautiful reefs over on Black, Grand Cayman, these are all created by living things. And that structure can be truly massive. Some places like over uh, the Fulton Florida, they call a reef, thousands and thousands of miles of reef tracks of a structure that's been built by, by living creatures, by coral. Right, so we have a question from Cayman Pratt, and the question is, how old grouper, uh, how, how old the grouper is, can you tell how old the grouper is by looking at it? Uh, only a little bit, so, like us, grouper start off small, Uh, because it turns out that the 
have a bone in their ear that we used to hear. And when people touch those fish, uh, we can call it going out, and we can uh, polish it, and that bone has rings in it. If we, and those are rings that are laid down every year. And so if we count those rings, that's how we can tell how old those fish are. Uh, can you point out and name some of the coral that we're seeing down there? That's the question. <laughs> now, we're actually going to uh, start heading up now, Todd. That's a good idea. Uh, let's see. So we're looking around for my dog buddy here. There, oh, there he is. My car. Uh, let's see. Uh, several different... Types of coral, uh, and lots of different soft coral as you get up to the, the top. I'm going to ask you guys at top if you can start to pull up some of the line, please. It looks like our sound is uh, not doing so well. So do you want to start popping up here, and I'll and I'll switch over to up here, Bryce. That sounds good. All right. Well, See you guys uh, when I get to the surface. We'll see you in a minute, Bryce. Can you hear me now? There we go. It looks like we're back. Um, so Bryce is going to be back on board with us in just a minute to wrap up our live feed and to answer some more questions from you guys. Um, in answer to Miss Thomas's class of what kind of coral is out there, uh, I saw some brain coral, but I'm actually going to introduce you to a scientist who's right next to me who could probably tell you all the different types of coral that are out here on uh, the uh, Cayman Reef. Uh, and his name is Steve Giddings. Why don't you come on over, Steve? I'm going to put you on here. Why don't you tell us some of the coral that we've seen out there? Well, well, I wasn't watching the video. Well, by the way, welcome everybody to the live feed. So they're Glad asking, you could what join kind us. Of coral is that coral reef actually? Okay. The one that they were just looking at. Well, if you if you count the different kind of corals that are on a Caribbean reef, and this is a classic Caribbean reef. You might find 70 or so different types of hard corals. Those are those rocky looking structures that some look like brains. Some have little star patterns all over them. They're all different shapes and sizes. Some look like little flowers. Some are just bright red. They're fire corals and they sting you when, they, when you touch them. There are probably 60 or 70 different types that you're likely to find here. Okay. Will you read this question aloud and answer yeah. that if you can? That question says, if it's from Cayman Prep, it says, we didn't hear the answer to our question. How can you tell how old a grouper is? Oh, well, you can tell. Can you repeat that question? Yeah, how, how old can you tell, or how can you tell how old a grouper is? When they're young, you can just look at the size of a grouper and know roughly how old it is. So if For you the, see one that's like that. You know it's a year or so old. Okay. Uh, it's in its first year when it's like that. It might be two years old, three years old, four years old, five years old. And then when they get to be about that age, that's when they start showing up out at the grouper hole for the spawning so fish about yay big or so 14 to 16 inches you know they're roughly that age once you get past eight or ten years old most of the groupers are roughly the same size and they don't continue to grow too much right. after that so, so then Bryce was talking about in, in a bone in their ear that the then, Could you explain then the that? other way to tell how old a fish is they have bony structures inside their ear much like we do and if you take one of those bones out after you catch a fish and, and look at it and clean it up, put it under a microscope, it has rings on it, just like a tree has like a rings. Tree. It's called, and they have a technique called 
uh, like sclerochronology. That is the m measurement of something based on the on the sclera or the the bony structures of things. You can do it with corals too. Corals so every have year that things. every year that bone is every year that bone lays down a little bit more uh, bone structure, and you can see if you X-ray the bone or even look through it at light with light, you can see light spots and dark spots, little bands, and each one of those bands might represent a year. Sometimes it represents other things like months or seasons, but you, but they can tell uh, how old a fish is based on the bone awesome. called an otolith. That's the name of the bone. Okay, Bryce is back from his dive, and I think we're going to trans transfer over to Bryce. Hold on a second. Okay, hi, friends. So um, they were still asking um, what kind of coral that was that you were looking at, and what is the major coral that's out there? Yeah, so a lot so of what we... That question. Yeah, so the, the question is what kind of coral is it? Um, I can't remember exactly which one we were looking at, but we were seeing a lot of brain coral down there. Uh, the, the common types of coral that we would see down there, there's, a, there's about six or seven different species uh, of large boulder type uh, coral that we would see down there. Um, there's a couple of species that used to be very common in the Caribbean, but we don't see much uh, here anymore. Uh, those are the, um, the branching coral, so like uh, staghorn coral and elk corn coral. And those used to be really, really common. And then uh, about 30 or 40 years ago, there was a disease that ran through the entire Caribbean, and it wiped out most of those corals. And so there's very few of those types of corals left here anymore. Um, but there is uh, some efforts to regrow those types of corals that is happening, including here on Little Cayman, uh, where they're actually growing some of those, those corals that we used to see a lot of and outplanting them or putting them back on the reef. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. Uh, we have another. Um, Brack is wanting to know when did CCMI start? When did CCMI start? That's the question. So CCMI stands for the Central Caribbean Marine Institute. And Boy, that's testing my memory a little bit, but I believe that that started uh, back in around uh, 96 to 98, I believe. So what is that? That's about uh, 20 years ago or so. So it's been around a couple of decades, um, and it's grown through time. It's, it's gotten uh, to be larger, and they have a big research station now that uh, scientists can come and stay and do, do science here on Little Cayman. Uh, from uh, we have another question here is how long can grouper live Cayman prep. and that's from Cayman prep so grouper can live as many as 30 years although I think most of them probably live somewhere between 15 and 20 years of age um, and in fact the reason we know that is because the Cayman Islands Department of Environment and the scientists uh, as part of that department uh, they did some of the first work to do age and growth studies on Nassau grouper from the populations here in the Caymans and, and they use, we talked about the, the, their ear bones, and they use those ear bones, they polish them up, and they counted the rings on them. And from that, we were able to get age data from the population here on Cable, Cayman. And some of the, the oldest ones were about 30 years old, which is pretty old for, yeah. for a fish. We have a few classes from the BRAC, and I know you guys have been out there this, uh, this, this year looking at the uh, NASA. Do you want to tell us a little bit about what you were seeing out there? Sure, yeah. So... Um, here on Little Cayman, the aggregation is on the very western tip of the island. Over on Cayman Brac, it's actually all the way on the eastern tip of the island. And so in order to study that population over there, we actually came from Little Cayman. We went over there for about five days or so, and we steamed all the way up to the eastern end of the island. And that site is very exposed because it's on the very, very, very outer edge of the eastern shelf. Um, so was, there's quite a bit of current. It's difficult to do diving up there. Uh, and we had pretty rough seas, but even still, we were able to get in the water and find the fish up there, and we saw hundreds of fish. Uh, it's hard to say right now how many exactly there are because uh, it's a deeper site and the fish are much more spread out, especially uh, when it's currenty like that. Um, but we've done some studies there using tags, so we we implant these small spaghetti-like tags in the in the sides of fish, and then we subsequently do counts of those individuals that are tagged and untagged. And we use that information to estimate the population size. So we're going to take all those counts and tagging information and data that we collected back to the lab, and we'll do some analysis on it. And that'll get us uh, to where we need to be in terms of coming up with a good estimate of the population. In addition to that, we did some surveys on the size of the fish using our stereo video system we talked about. Uh, we, we zoomed around the site, the, the site where the aggregation is on, on BRAC. Uh, on scooters, we actually use uh, what are they're underwater, they look like torpedoes, but you put them on your tank, 
and then you've got a button. You press that button, and it's got a propeller that spins, and it shoots you forward. And it's really handy to have that uh, when you've got a current situation, when the, the water is kind of sweeping along like a river, we can, we can go against that. And using that scooter, we zoomed around the site with our stereo video system, and we'll again bring that back to the lab, and we can measure the fish uh, from that stereo system to get information on the sizes of the fish that we're seeing over there on BRAC as well. But like I said before, we were definitely seeing some pretty big old fish over there on BRAC. And, and also what was fun is a, a lot of them are very friendly fish as well. So as soon as you hit the water, they'd swim up to you and kind of hang out with you for the whole dive. It was right, just a lot of fun. Um, so you're going to pass it off to me. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, I appreciate you guys taking the time to come on a dive with us today. I had a lot of fun. And I'm going to pass you back to Todd. Uh, and... Uh, well, hopefully we'll see you all soon. All right. Uh, so we are gonna wrap things up here. Unless any of you guys have more questions, um, I'm happy to help answer them. Um, but if you uh, think of questions that you'd like to ask me or any of the researchers uh, when we get off of this live feed today, um, you can go on to the blog and and write a question on any of the blog posts that I've put on there, and I will go and ask one of the scientists and, and answer you right away. Um, I do see Cayman Prep asked, how many grouper do you think there are living around the Cayman Islands? Um, and I'm not sure that we have a very good uh, uh, estimate uh, for grand, um, at least I'm not sure, but it sounds like on little, um, the aggregation here is around six or 7,000 fish, which is by far the biggest uh, aggregation left in the Caribbean, um, which is a really special and unique thing uh, and, and uh, something that we should protect. Um, and so, uh, and, and like Bryce said, they're seeing maybe a couple of hundred uh, NASA out on one of the aggregations on, uh, on the BRAC. Um, so that, that's, that's about where they are right now uh, with the NASA. Um, but I just wanna thank you guys so much for joining us. If you missed the first part of today's live uh, feed, I will send a link to your, to your teacher as soon as we're done here uh, that will link you to the whole live feed and you can, you can rewatch the beginning if you would like. Um, and unless there's any other questions, I'm gonna sign off for today. Thank you guys so much here. I'm gonna put you on the internet. There you are, Cayman Prep, so good to see you. There we go, the Brack. So good to see you guys. Spot, oh, Spot Bay is gone now. But there you go. So wonderful to see you. You guys have a great day. And we'll see you next time on the Grouper Moon Project. Bye-bye.